Got myself some wisdom from a leather bag book. Got myself a savior when I took a second look. Mm-hmm. Opened up the pages and what did I find? A black and white portrait of a king who's a friend of mine Funny how when you think you're right everybody else must be wrong Till someone with fool's wisdom somehow comes along His voice was strange and the words he said I didn't quite understand Yet I knew that he was speaking right by the leatherback book in his hand Hey Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is James Jacob Prash from Morio Ministries, coming to you here on RTN Christian TV and Radio from Scotland. RTN is Scotland's leading Christian TV and radio internet platform. We have a variety of features. We have everything from podcasts to social media, Christian radio, etc., and a wide range of speakers, Bible expositors, evangelists, and some very edifying and Christ-honoring worship music. We are in this at RTN for the Lord. We're in it to reach the lost, and we're in it for you. Please avail yourself of our resources and tell others about RTN. I myself, tomorrow, the 14th of January, I'm scheduled to be speaking at 10.30 a.m. if you are in the south of England, particularly if you are in the southeast of England. I am scheduled to be at the ARC Christian Fellowship, 10.30 a.m. at Swallowfield Village Hall. Swallowfield is just south of Reading, between Reading and Basingstoke, and we'll be there at 10.30 a.m. Swallowfield Village Hall, the ARC Christian Fellowship, tomorrow. On the uh, 27th of this month, I'm due to be speaking at the Church of the Open Door in New York City on 3rd Avenue and East 7th Street, 3rd Avenue and 7th Street opposite Cooper Union. It is a Moriel church, and we shall be there at 7 p.m. on the 27th. On the 28th, we will be at the Church of the Open Door, also a Moriel Fellowship, in Baltimore, Baltimore, Maryland. The details are on the Moriel website, moriel.org, on the itinerary page, or just Google Moriel itinerary, 
After that, we have dates in Texas and in um, Pennsylvania and in California, near Los Angeles. Be that as it may, turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 24, the 24th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. False Christs and false prophets will arise. They will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. False Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. This is quite a subject in itself. If you're interested in this subject, and we all should be interested in prophecy as we get closer to the return of Jesus, I authored a book which was published some time ago called The Shadows of the Beast, Shadows of the Beast, and it is how the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, or better put, faithful Christians. And on it, we have a number of figures historical figures who foreshadow the Antichrist. We have Napoleon, we have Adolf Hitler, we have the Pope, etc. in the cover. Why is this design appropriate? In Scripture, there are multiple types of the Antichrist who are scriptural figures who foreshadow aspects of the character of Antichrist and whose antics the Antichrist and the false prophet will in some way replay. Among these are backslidden Solomon. The number of the beast is used twice, 666, in connection with Solomon when he backslides. We obviously have Nebuchadnezzar and his image, the image of Nebuchadnezzar prefiguring the image of the beast in Revelation 13. We have Judas Iscariot, the son of perdition. We have a number of figures like this throughout Scripture. Amalek, Haman, Judas Iscariot, Baxlin Solomon, and others. All of them are important. When the Antichrist comes, he will come in the character of those people in some way or will in some way do something that they did again. He will replay what they did. However, this becomes particularly important of figures who are predicted in Scripture but don't emerge in Scripture. The chief of these is from the book of Daniel, the predictions about Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV who, of course, set up the image of himself in the temple. Actually, it was with the Greek god Zeus, who the Romans identified with the planet Jupiter, and he gave Zeus his own facial features on the statue, or the statue of Zeus with his own features, and he slaughtered a pig in the temple. These are predicted in Daniel, and they are canonized in the New Testament by Jesus in John 10 having celebrated the Feast of Hanukkah, called the Feast of Dedication in most English translations. However, the historical record of the fulfillment is found in the apocryphal literature, the books 1st and 2nd Maccabees. Now, those books are not canonical. They're not a basis of doctrine in and of themselves, but they are biblically important history and literature. They do record the fulfillment of things predicted in Scripture, which Jesus himself personally affirmed in John 10. Historical types of the Antichrist. There's not going to be a Scripture that's going to tell us who these coming false Christs and false prophets will be. Their character is described. What they will do is described. And in some way, they will foreshadow, typify the ultimate two beasts of Revelation 13 from the earth and from the sea, who we generally identify as Antichrist and false prophet, even 
though Revelation 13 don't exactly put it that way. Many of them. Now, we can talk about the increase in false prophets that have been taking place over the last 150 years. They've always been around. They were around in the early church. We can talk about Charles Tazzy Russell and Rutherford, the founders of the Jehovah's Witnesses. They were false teachers and false prophets. We can talk about Joseph Smith and Brigham Young from the Mormons. We can talk about Sun Young Moon, the founder of the Unification Church, who claimed to be the return of Christ, the Lord of the Second Advent. There are many, many, many of such false Christ and false prophets. And false messiah is a false Christ. Throughout the history of the Jews, we have seen this phenomena replayed. While most Jews, albeit not all, rejected the true Messiah, they followed many false ones in his place or in his stead. This is true of Simon Bar Kokhba, it's true of Jacob Frank, it's true of Shabbat Taisvi, it's true all the way to the modern era with Menachem Schneerson, and now there's a new rabbi in vogue who they're calling a messianic figure in Israel among the ultra Orthodox. There's always been false messiahs among the Jews. There's always been false Christs. There's types of the Antichrist in the Old Testament, and there have been historical Antichrists <clears throat> partially fulfilling and directly fulfilling the prophecies of Daniel. And also, we see this in Matthew 24 in the Olivet Discourse and in the synoptic parallels to the Olivet Discourse in the other synoptic gospels. Many false Christs. Now, <clears throat> when a false Christ occurs in conjunction with a false prophet, one is a director to the other. One directs people to follow the other. The false prophet of Revelation 13 will point people to the Antichrist and his image. Okay? Whenever you see a false Christ, you will normally find a false prophet pointing to him. Now, sometimes this has become extremely difficult to address. Many people consider the late Jerry Falwell, the very politically motivated fundamentalist preacher in America uh, associated with Liberty University to have been a believer. And I'm not judging whether he was or wasn't. I'm not judging his faith. But he got a contribution from Sun Young Moon, the Lord of the Second Advent, who, as he claimed in his book, The Divine Principle, he claimed to be the return of Christ. And he, he came to Liberty University, gave a big contribution, and Jerry Falwell celebrated this false Christ, a self-proclaimed false Christ, Jerry Falwell celebrated him as, quote-unquote, an unsung hero. <clears throat> if possible, the elect will be deceived. This teaches how the Antichrist <clears throat> will even try to deceive born-again believers. There will be clergy, leaders in the church, who will be anointed or used by Satan in some way to point people to the Antichrist, the same as Falwell pointed people to Moon. Now, Falwell never actually said Moon was the Antichrist, but he called an Antichrist an unsung hero and got a lot of money from him. These things increase. The fact that cults have increased so much, although they've always been around, but also in the political realm, we have seen an explosion, an avalanche of Antichrist type political despots. Now, again, going back to the deified emperors of pagan Rome, especially people, well, well, certainly General Pompey, but Caesar Augustus and the other emperors who were deified by the Roman Senate, these are pictures of the Antichrist. Every pope of Rome identifies himself as an Antichrist. He claims to be the vicar of Christ, another Christ, vicarious Christus, one who acts as the vicar of Christ. 
Now, we know that in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is the vicar of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the only vicar of Christ. Yet the Pope usurps that position for himself to the point where he claims to be able to be to speak infallibly when he invokes something called ex cathedra, claiming he's speaking from the chair of Peter. Now you understand how dangerous and wicked these men have been historically. The present Pope is saying that the Roman Catholic clergy should bless same-sex relationships, should bless homosexuals and lesbians in a same-sex union of, 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 of marital imitation, even though <clears throat> Their own catechism, on one hand, calls it, quote-unquote, a mortal sin. He's saying you have to bless it. This is how corrupt the papacy is and how hypocritical. But as despondent as so many Catholics are today at the behavior of this present pope, believe me, he's not the first one to be utterly depraved. Many of them have been pedophile-protecting operators they've they they they've orchestrated an international campaign policy to protect pedophile clergy at the expense of not protecting their own children in the catholic church we've talked about this before this is the level of corruption we're dealing with when we talk about the roman papacy <clears throat> remember the reformers themselves were from the intelligentsia of the Roman Catholic Church. They were Roman Catholic clergy who were second-generation humanist scholars. They were educated men who had been Roman Catholic priests. And when they came into an understanding of the original meaning of the original languages of Scripture and so forth, because of Erasmus of Rotterdam and others, they realized what the papacy was. They realized it was an antichrist institution as Roman Catholic priests who are, again, scholarly from the intelligentsia of the Roman Catholic clergy. We've talked about these things before, and again, they're addressed in the book Shadows of the Beast. Not that I'm trying to make a sales pitch or an advertisement, but the book's available through the Morio website, through Amazon, through certain bookshops, and so forth. In any event, <clears throat> let's look. These false Christs are going to come. So when you have an antichrist figure, there is often some kind of political dimension to him. Most commonly, there's a political dimension, even though there may also be a religious dimension. Sun Young Moon in the politics of South Korea was, was one such person. Okay. There's a religious dimension and a augmenting a political dimension. A false prophet will come, and he will be the opposite. He will have a religious dimension augmented by a political one. They'll be the opposite. One will be more political than religious. The other will be more religious than political, but they complement each other. Okay. The... Again, they've always been around, going back to the time of the Roman emperors and even before that with Pharaoh and Haman and so forth. They were around in the Old Testament and the early church throughout the centuries. But we've seen something in the last hundred years or less that is overtaking the world, particularly the Western world, but not only the Western world. You see the virtual deification of these religious figures, where a cult of religious magnitude surrounds them. I recall going to see Lenin's re-embalmed corpse. About 23% of it is Lenin. The rest is wax and <laughs> embalming fluid. But they paid a religious homage to this guy who was an atheist. And big signs of him in Red Square with Marx and Engels and, and Lenin. It was their religion. Soviet communism was a religion. They replaced religion in the conventional sense. At St. Basil's Cathedral in Red Square opposite the Kremlin, 
and adjacent to the mausoleum where Lenin's remains were, they took the crosses off and they replaced Eastern Orthodox or Russian Byzantine Christendom. I'd be reluctant to call it Christianity, but they replaced anything of, of, of a Christian imagery with this kind of de facto deification of Lenin. He was their savior. He was there. He was. They kept embalming him because they couldn't let him die, as it were, in their thinking. And when you went into the tomb, the military guards would say, shh, shh, you couldn't talk out of respect. It's like as if you were in a church service. That was their thinking. There was a religious aspect and a religious political union to it. When the Antichrist and false prophet of Revelation 13 arrive on the scene, and they may already be alive, we have to be well aware of these kinds of things, historically, and first of all, biblically, and how history has played out these prophecies. These emperors of the ancient world were the first ones the church faced, even though there were similar people in the Old Testament that Israel faced, and multiple false messiahs throughout the history of the Jews since that time to the present day. However, in the last perhaps 75 years, to 100 years, we've seen Mao, we've seen Adolf Hitler, we've seen Joseph Stalin, we've seen Lenin, we've seen Nikolai Ceausescu, we've seen Kim Jong-il and his son Kim Jong-un and his grandfather, a dynasty of these Korean communist dictators who basically demand to be deified. There's actually a statue of the grandfather of the present mad dictator of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, and the statue was huge. It's like the Statue of Liberty or something, and people have to bow down to it in a religious manner. They must bow down to it in religious reverence. It's considered political blasphemy not to do so. Notice there is a religiosity or a religious dimension associated with the political philosophy. Communists can claim to be atheists, but in fact, man is going to worship something. Ultimately, if they don't, he doesn't worship God, he will worship himself. The ultimate example of this will, of course, be the Antichrist and the false prophet of Revelation 13. So you see these patterns of behavior with Chairman Mao, the Red Book, replaced the scripture. Okay, the sayings of Chairman Mao. You see this, obviously, with people like Ceausescu and Kim Jong-un, Idi Amin in Africa, and even before that, with people like Shaka Zulu in Africa and so forth, there's always been people like that. Uh, we talk in the book about other historical figures foreshadowing the Antichrist and how he will come to power, uh, Napoleon being one of them. Again, I point you to the book. But I'd like just to talk about one today that it's not, who's not the only one. I could do a similar presentation about someone like Joseph Stalin. But today we're going to look at Adolf Hitler. Many false Christs will come and false prophets will arise after them. Let's begin with the false prophet. One of the ways Hitler was able to generate that kind of enthusiasm and phenomena was through mass demonization. He was demonically empowered. But in the ideology of the Nazis, his propaganda minister was Goebbels. 
Goebbels was so evil and crazy himself that he had his own children and wife murdered with cyanide in Hitler's bunker before Hitler took his own life. Goebbels murdered his own children, his own little kids. These people were utterly demon-possessed. Himmler, some, many of the other Nazis, Eichmann, they, they, they were, these men were demonized, obviously. Hitler's henchmen. And they teach about the character and nature of the cohorts of Antichrist we read about in Daniel and Revelation. Antichrist and false prophet are going to have their colleagues, their associates, who they're going to empower. This foreshadows something that's coming. So let's look what Goebbels did. Winston Churchill understood this. He began referring to the Germans during the Second World War and during the Holocaust as the Hun, as the Hun. What Goebbels did was he resurrected the imagery and the political military philosophy, the military philosophy and the imagery of the ancient Teutonic war gods, the ancient war gods of Germany. You had similar things in Nordic mythology with the Valkyrie and with Odin and things like this, but you had a Germanic version of it. It's all demonic in nature. And Hitler, like Stalin, was a socialist. He was a socialist. Let's understand something. The three biggest mega murderers of the 20th century, Mao, killed 40 million plus people, Stalin, perhaps 55 million, and Hitler, at least 25 million. All of them were socialists. All of them were Darwinists. All of them were socialists and all were Darwinists. Now, that hints about something, about the nature of Antichrist and about the Antichrist nature of Darwinism. God becomes displaced as creator, the world was made through Jesus in John chapter 1 and Proverbs chapter 8. When Adam heard God walking in the garden, it was Jesus. But that becomes displaced and replaced by Darwinism. Darwinism displaces and replaces creation. It's an antichrist philosophy, a replacement for religion, as it were. It becomes a religion in itself. And based on the scientific realities that there's no transmutation of DNA in the natural environment across the genus barrier, and that information cannot come from a vacuum, the claims of Darwinism require more faith to believe than the empirical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. In other words, if you look at the evidence, scientifically, empirically, <clears throat> analytically, you need a religious faith to believe in Darwinism because of the contrary science. It replaces <clears throat> what the scripture says. In fact, <clears throat> Paul says our faith is reasonable. There are credible reasons to believe in the historicity of Jesus and the Gospels. Darwinism, you've got too many fundamental problems that make it impossible. Some of these people, going back to the time of Watson and Crick and even that arrogant Dawkins guy, has suggested that UFOs seeded the biosphere of planet Earth with DNA or with nucleic acids. Well, where did the UFOs come from? Gods from other planets. This is how absurd. And these are the le leading, leading apologists for Darwinism, <clears throat> saying these crazy things with no evidence. Notice it becomes a religion in itself, and it requires a faith, and a faith that's not reasonable once examined comprehensively. So Hitler was, Mao was, and Stalin were all Darwinistic. 
Okay. Communism is based on Hegelian philosophy that derives from Darwinistic thought. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. The whole Hegelian model comes from the propositions of Darwin, the pseudoscience of Darwin. Well, let's look at this. They're all socialists. They're all Darwinists. That tells us something. That tells us something about the Antichrist to come. There's more to Darwinism than Darwinism. Um, Darwinism becomes a pseudoscientific basis for racism. Because it was Caucasians who went to the moon and who had the Industrial Revolution, therefore, people of color are genetically inferior. Blacks are genetically inferior. They didn't go to the moon. Evolution's a constant process, so it's Caucasians who are... Well, wait a minute. At other times in history, blacks were the overachievers. And you've got Asian versions of this. The Japanese who believed in Shintoism looked down upon other Asians. What they did to the Chinese and Filipinos and Koreans was unspeakable. But again, the religious ideology of Imperial Japan under Hirohito and the warlords during the Second World War, it combined Shintoism with, with the military philosophy of Japanese imperialism. The religious and the political, if you can follow me, which dehumanized other people. Same as Hitler dehumanized Jews and gypsies. He dehumanized. Stalin subhumanized Ukrainians and other Slavs. He, in order to meet export quotas of grain, three times, three times, most seriously in 1927, he allowed massive famines of millions and millions of people in the name of communism. He allowed his own people, he allowed people of the Soviet Union to starve to death to meet export quotas, subhumanizing and dehumanizing those who don't agree with them. Well, what Hitler did, what Stalin did, what the imperial Japanese did, they're going to do the same thing with the Antichrist and false prophet. These things teach about what is coming in some way. I hope you're able to follow me. Let's today take Adolf Hitler. Again, we can do such a presentation with Stalin, others, but today, let's look at Hitler. Let's look at Adolf Hitler. The false prophet pointing to the Antichrist. Again, Goebbels resurrected the Teutonic war gods. Going back to the Teutonic tribes and before that, the Huns. That's why Churchill would refer to them that way in his speeches on the BBC during the war. He understood the history and the philosophy on back of what Goebbels was doing to point people to Hitler, to National German Socialist Workers' Party. That's what it was. It was a Socialist Workers' Party. It was a, it was a, it was a labor party, a Socialist Labor Party wed to German nationalism. Well, you got a false prophet with some kind of a quasi-religious ideology that replaces other religion or corrupts other religion. Let's begin with that religious dimension. It is always in a quagmire that is, first of all, economic, then leading to a social-cultural decadence. A collapse not only of institutions, but of reason, of reason, where a pandemonium results. This is what happened in the French Revolution after the Estates General, and with it came hyperinflation. Out of this emerged 
Napoleon Bonaparte. Okay. My father lived in Shanghai when Mao came to power and Shanghai, Chiang Kai-shek was deposed. My father described to me how he saw people in Shanghai with barrels, wheelbarrows of money. The money was worth so little. He said they went to a restaurant and they put bundles and bundles of money on a table and they had enough for two eggs and two beers. This is what happened in the Wehrmacht Germany. In the aftermath of the Versailles Treaty, people were indignant. Germany was not fairly treated after the First World War. In the opinion of even many non-Germans, but what also happened was the hyperinflation of the Wehrmacht and a class decadence. This imagery of the class decadence was uh, the, the background theme of, of, of the Broadway musical and West End musical and then the film with Liza Minnelli called Cabaret. That was the background of what was happening in the story of Cabaret and how it happened, this kind of decadence. Okay. I recall in my youth, it was imitated by somebody called Brian McLaren, who came to New York, and I was there when he came to Club 82, and he saw this underground rock scene that evolved out of a band called the Velvet Underground with Lou Reed, and there were these people, I knew them, I knew some of them, I, I know most of them, like, like the New York Dolls and people like this, and McLaren saw this in New York, and he came back to England and began the Sex Pistols. And it was the idea, there's no future. It was like Wehrmacht Germany. The youth had no future. Well, out of what happened in the Wehrmacht, you had a Hitler youth, a Hitler youth. We will give these young people a sense of identity and direction they don't have amidst the economic chaos and the lack of economic future. Um, there was a, a, a reggae band in England called UB40, which was the name of an unemployment card that the youth had. And that was the pop music and the pop culture. It was seen as a replay of the Wehrmacht with, with the whole punk movement. It, it, you're going to have this kind of pandemonium. Anarchy. They, they, would, they would sing anarchy in the UK, anarchy in the UK. This kind of phenomena. Only in the Vamar, it was taken to its natural conclusions and seized upon by the Nazis, much the same as Napoleon seized upon it in the aftermath of the French Revolution in the early 19th century. Move ahead. A religious dimension. The Stattenkirch of Germany, the state church is Lutheran. And then in Bavaria, you have the Roman Catholic Church. Around Munich, places like that, Germany is more Roman Catholic. In central Germany and northern Germany, it is more Lutheran. Nine of the 14 Lutheran bishops, nine of the 14 supported Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, nine of 14. There were certain Lutherans who came to oppose him and complained that Lutheranism did not withstand him. One of these was the academic theologian Karl Barth, who came to the United States and had a very low view of American academic scholarship, of academic theology. It was not higher critical. Um, German theology had become higher critical. We have to understand this. Traditional German conservative Protestantism, German evangelicism, things that had been at previous times in history been associated with groups like the Moravians, who... who, who, who were like the Methodists of Europe. They, they're the ones who led John and Charles Wesley to Christ at a crusade in London. And uh, at Aldersgate, 
and and the Pietist movement and things like Count Zizendorf and things of this nature. Evangelical Lutheranism was demolished theologically and declined numerically, and its spiritual and moral influence were next to nil. 19th century German rationalism took over German theology out of a university called Tübingen, and from this came higher criticism. People like Rudolf Bultmann and Councilman and Perens and these other people who said there's a difference between the Jesus of faith and the Jesus of history. The real Jesus of history did no miracles. Nobody can believe in miracles in the age of the electric light. That was their teaching. And this took over most of European Protestantism. Certainly in the United States as well, it became liberal Protestantism. The World Council of Churches came from this in its ontogeny. That's what you see. Higher criticism was their approach to the Bible. They no longer studied the scripture as doctrine, but simply as literature and ancient history that was not true history. It was mythology. They mythologized everything. They said it was not true. It was myths that simply embellished certain factual events that may have happened, but they're all embellished. It was all mythologized. <laughs> when the preaching of the gospel goes down, the ancient principalities, demonic powers, will always reassert themselves. And that is what happened in Germany. The church became corrupted. The Roman church, the Catholic church, was always corrupt. But now Protestantism became corrupted. <clears throat> People began to realize this as early as the 17th century. The Moravians tried to reform Protestantism as the reformers initially tried to reform Catholicism, beginning with Zwingli. <clears throat> but by the time you got to 19th century German rationalism <clears throat> and higher criticism and liberal Protestantism, the game was over. Karl Barth came from this, and he came to New York. It was at Columbia University, and again, he had a negative view of American scholarship. He thought it was academically inferior. It was not higher critical. He was at a place, Columbia University is on Morningside Heights. It is on the west side of Upper Manhattan between the Hudson River and Harlem, Harlem, <laughs> which had been an Irish ghetto an Irish shantytown that became a black African-American ghetto. And then East Harlem, the barrio, I've explained this before, became a Hispanic ghetto, largely Puerto Rican initially. So you had the barrio, East Harlem, which was Hispanic, Harlem, which was black, although originally poor Irish. And then you had Morningside Heights, where Columbia University, Riverside Church, and Grant's tomb were overlooking this impoverished neighborhood. And then the river was on the other side. And Karl Barth was there. And for some reason, somehow, he wandered down into Harlem to Abyssinian Baptist Church. I've explained this before. And he heard the father of the corrupt congressman, Adam Clayton Powell, who had been a true man of God, by all accounts, a dynamic preacher, but a true man of God who cared about the poor and really did preach the gospel but he <clears throat> ministered to the poor of Harlem during the Great Depression. Now, the Great Depression was fueling the Weimar in Germany. It was fueling it. In the, the, the Depression and the Versailles Treaty, it was fueling the economic and social breakdown of Germany out of the chaos that it, that it, that it resulted in is what gave platform and rise to Hitler or at least a market for Hitler's product, among certain sectors of, of the German population initially. 
Carl Barth goes down and he hears the gospel preached with passion and conviction by this black American preacher, an Abyssinian Baptist church. And he goes from a liberal to a conservative position theologically. He changes his view. There were a number of theological liberals. In Britain, it was J.A.T. Robinson, a liberal Anglican bishop who went from a liberal position to a conservative position theologically. He said that the Gospel of John could not have been written in the third century, as the higher critic said. It had to be a first century document. The authors of the Gospel of John are too familiar with the Jewish culture of the first century, that is Second Temple period Judaism. And these guys became more conservative. Many think they became believers, saved, regenerate believers. It was Barth who spoke against the Lutheran establishment. But the mainstream Lutheran establishment supported Hitler. The Roman Catholic Church was the same. The Cardinal of Vienna, with the blessings of the Vatican, supported the Anschluss, the forced annexation of Austria into Germany. Hitler himself was an Austrian by birth, not a German. And he made efforts to hide his Austrian accent. He was born on the border, on the river, but he was an Austrian and he had an Austrian accent, which he went to great pains to hide. And he didn't like the Prussian Germans, people with names like Vaughn or something like this. He didn't like the, the old German aristocracy or Prussians. He was an Austrian and he was not from the privileged social classes. He was lower middle class a corporal in the First World War. <clears throat> That's all, like Napoleon, a corporal. So the Catholic Church said, and the Cardinal said, it was the duty of Roman Catholics in Austria to support the annexation of Austria. Again, a movie I don't like, I think it's for nerds, but it's a, a famous movie called um, The Sound of Music, again, the background of the sound of music was this era, this aristocratic family. <clears throat> Julie Andrews was the uh, nanny, the mom of, of, of the children of this admiral in the Austro, had been an admiral in the Austro-Hungarian Navy. Of, and he opposed Hitler and opposed the Nazis. And that was the background of the sound, the sound of music. Um, Again, whether you like cabaret or not, or whether you like the sound of music or not, the historical backgrounds of those films are, are quite interesting, against which the stories took place. <clears throat> well, anyway, the Catholic Church pushed this. In Yugoslavia, the Ustashi Nazis had the blessings of Archbishop Stepanak with the approval of the Vatican. Many Jews, certainly gypsies, many Jews, and three quarters of a million Serbian Eastern Orthodox were murdered by the Ustashi Nazis. But an Eastern Orthodox Serb could save their neck if they converted to Roman Catholicism. This really happened. This really, under Pius XII, the Pope, this happened. You had this whole phenomenon. The Catholic Church then plays a pivotal, maybe the pivotal role in bringing Hitler to power. The whole thing happened in the times of, of von Hindenburg and all this kind of stuff, but the Wehrmacht happened. There was something in Munich called the Zentrum, the Zentrum, the Roman Catholic Party of Bavaria made a coalition with Hitler. There was somebody who Pope John XXIII made a cardinal. His name was Michael Schmaus, Herr Schmaus. And John XXIII gave him the honorary title, the theologian of Munich. Schmaus, Schmaus told Bavarian Roman Catholics it was their duty as Catholics 
as German Catholics to support Hitler and the Third Reich. And he gets rewarded by John the Twenty Third, promoted to the rank of cardinal within their hierarchy. And he's called the theologian of Munich. This was Schmaus. There's an excellent book called Hitler's Pope by a Roman Catholic author, a good researcher and historian and a good writer, but he's Roman Catholic. He didn't have an anti-Catholic bias. <clears throat> John Cornwallis, and he wrote the book Hitler's Pope, a book well worth reading. The Zentrum <clears throat> was led by somebody called Hans von Papen. Hans von Papen. He made a deal with Hitler. Now at Nuremberg, von Papen was not sentenced to death because of the interference of Pope Pius XII with the American government. Otherwise, he was a candidate for the gallows. But von Papen had an interesting history. There was a September 11th attack in New York Harbor on the area on back of what is now the Statue of Liberty, where I'm from, called Black Tom, Black Tom. And the United States was supplying Britain and France with armaments okay. <clears throat> before America entered the First World War under Woodrow Wilson. The Irish American community, <clears throat> which was very large and which politically controlled New York with somebody called, um, with, with Tammany Hall, a political institution of the Democratic Party called Tammany Hall, the Irish Catholics controlled New York City politically. They got it away from the Protestant establishment. The same thing happened in New Jersey, just opposite Manhattan, around the Statue of Liberty with somebody called Frank Hague. These were powerful political machines in the United States, controlled by Irish who had a high birth rate. In Boston, it became the Kennedys, Joseph B. Kennedy, the father of JFK. In Chicago, it was Daly, the Daly family, the Cook County machine, the most corrupt political organization to this day in the United States. Um, but it was founded by Irish politicians. Again, I'm not anti-Irish, my mother's Irish. Uh, but I'm just saying what happened. And Irish Americans were angry over what happened with the Easter uprising. Their parents had come from Ireland during the potato famine, and they were raised on that legacy. And then with the history of the black and tan and the Easter uprising, Irish America was very anti-British at that time, including Joseph P. Kennedy. And there were German Americans who were sympathetic to Hitler, such as Charles Lindbergh. He was a, an icon among icons at that time in history, having flown the Atlantic. Irish stevedores, longshoremen, they, they had those jobs on the docks, the Union racketeering and so forth. This is before the Italian mafia came into the power it later acquired. Organized crime was largely Irish and Jewish initially. And again, my family's a mixture of Irish and Jewish. I'm not attacking Jews or Irish. <laughs> Just telling historical truth. Irish stevedores sabotaged Black Tom, where all these docks were, where these weapons and munitions were going to Britain. And they blew the thing up. It was the biggest terror attack in the history of the United States before September 11th. Who orchestrated, planned this attack. Hans von Papen. He was the bin Laden, the bin Laden of the early 20th century in the United States. He's the one who did it in the early days of World War I, just prior to Woodrow Wilson taking America into the war after promising he wouldn't. Anyway, this was the Bin Laden. This was Hans von Papen. Von Papen makes his way back to Europe and he becomes the privy chamberlain to the Pope, the privy chamberlain to the Pope, the highest ranking layman in the Roman Catholic Church at that time. 
and he makes a deal to bring Hitler to power. Hitler comes into power through coalition politics, through an election. Hitler was elected through coalition politics. This is one of the dangers of proportional representation and of parliamentary systems of democracy. Parliamentary systems have their advantages, but one disadvantage is if nobody gets a majority in the parliament, you have to make a coalition with other people who you may not like or agree with, and that's how Hitler got power. Von Papen, with the blessings of the Vatican, brings Hitler to power in Germany. Hitler would not have come to power had it not been for that coalition. Meantime, you've got Roman Catholic cardinals in Vienna and in Munich making endorsement of Hitler and the Nazis a Roman Catholic religious crusade, virtually. The same as what happened with the Ustashi Nazis, and that was really, really terrible. But it really happened with Archbishop Stepanak. Anyway, the religious dimension to Hitler's rise comes into power. Corrupt religion, even that which professes to be Christian. I speak of the mainstream Lutherans, Protestantism, and I speak of Roman Catholicism. Antichrist will do something similar. He will use religion to get power. But it will not be only Islam or only Eastern religions. It will be apostate Christendom. Apostate Christendom will be a mechanism through which the Antichrist will get power. The false prophet will always have the religious dimension like Goebbels did for Hitler. There'll always be a false prophet in conjunction with an Antichrist. We have to understand the ascent of the Nazis to understand the ascent of the Antichrist. Now, again, this is only one aspect of what is going to happen. We could speak about what transpired with Mao. We can speak about what transpired with Stalin. Certainly, we could tell a similar saga about other figures. Now we're talking about Hitler. So he comes to power politically in coalition backed by apostate Christianity. Antichrist will do the same in some way. Let's move on and look at this. Daniel describes Antichrist and things like this and, and, and the historical figures prefiguring him. They will speak lies to each other at the same table, says in Daniel. Hitler did the same thing. Although Stalin was just as bad as Hitler, Hitler negotiated with Stalin before Operation Barbarossa, before Hitler invaded Russia. He made a treaty with Stalin and agreed to divide Eastern Europe, to sacrifice Poland's autonomy and independence. Hitler negotiated with Stalin, and he was able to connive Stalin. One liar connived another, just like what was described in Daniel, what the Antichrist will do. Then there was Chamberlain, following what happened with the annexation of the Sudeten and the whole situation with Alsace-Lorraine in France which goes back to the Versailles Treaty and aftermath of World War I, there were areas that had been German-speaking, East Prussia, around Danzig and Poland, 
Germany wanted the German world reunited. He wanted Austria. He wanted Alsace-Lorraine. He wanted East Prussia. He wanted the Sudeten in what is today the Czech Republic. He wanted these things. So he negotiated with the main world power. Britain predominated in the League of Nations, the predecessor of the United Nations, and he negotiated with Chamberlain. He conned Chamberlain. Appeasement. Just give him this, just give him this. The same as with Biden and Obama with Iran and, and Bush with the Saudi Arabians. Just give them this, just give them as if they can be appeased. They can't, but that was the mentality. Same thing as you see today with radical Islam. You know, the Houthis are doing this very weak. Biden took the Houthis off the list, the State Department's official index list of terrorist organizations. They were said, Biden de declared them to be not terrorists, which he did to please Iran. You make appeasement. You, you try, it doesn't work. Well, that is what happened with Chamberlain in Britain. Hitler was able to deceive people he negotiated with. The book of Daniel tells us Antichrist will be a similar operator. He'll get people to make a deal with him, then he will get himself in position and break it. The same as Iran with its with, with its uranium enrichment. You know, it gets Obama to, to unfreeze hundreds of billions of dollars of assets to fund Islamic terror. And it's the stupidity of the American government and the corruption of, 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 of American politicians, they do it. Well, that is how Hitler operated. That is how the Antichrist will operate. You can they should have stopped Hitler in Munich, people said. Yeah, they said it after it was too late. Anybody can lock the bar the barn door after the horse escapes. And that's what Britain did. But it goes on. So now they get betrayed. You are going to see a politics and a diplomacy based on betrayal and stupidity. Same as Chamberlain. Same as Stalin. They're going to get taken in by an Antichrist, by the Antichrist. The same as, you know, Obama and, and Biden and, and, and Bush, the same thing, the same as Eden, the same as Stalin. They get taken in. This teaches, in part, what the Antichrist is going to do. So there'll be this false peace. Remember, the Antichrist will bring a false peace to the Middle East. That's why I say beware of the Abraham Accords. No peace will come to the Middle East until Jesus reigns from the throne of David and the millennium. All this hope and Donald Trump said we're going to have the Abraham Accords. Look, I voted for Donald Trump twice. I'm not voting for him again, but I'm not trying to speak politically here. But um, the Abraham Accords is dangerous. If you read the book of Daniel, you see where it's going and what it's going to come to. A false peace of the Middle East brokered by the Antichrist. This is going to happen. Now, what happened? Hitler negotiated with the Mufti because the Muftis hated Jews. The Islamic clergy of what was then the British Mandate. Today, it's Israel and Jordan. Hitler always had ambitions on the Middle East. It was Rommel in North Africa, and it was his dealings with the Mufti, the Hosseini family, who were related to the Yasser Arafat's family. I don't want to divert too much, but they found a 
Arab who had blue eyes so Hitler would talk to him because Hitler was very racist. <laughs> Hitler always had ambitions on the Middle East. So did Napoleon. So did Mussolini. Antichrists always do. So, this element of deception, saying that peace, peace, but there is no peace. That is going to be a big event, according to Paul and Jeremiah. They say peace, peace, but there is no peace. No, false peace. When Chamberlain came back to London, they said peace, peace, but there is no peace. Stalin negotiated with Hitler, went back to Moscow, peace, peace, but there is no peace. Just being set up. Obama with Iran, peace, peace, there is no peace, no peace. These things point to Antichrist. Now, what else we see? Notice how these Antichrists, notice how this case Hitler, but there's others, they operate in that character. Hitler teams up with the Imperial Japanese. He thought that if America entered the war, he would not have to fear America coming to the aid of Britain the way it happened in World War I. He lived his life in the shadow of World War I and the German defeat and the, uh, the Versailles Treaty. That's what Hitler was reacting to. That is why so many German people supported him. <clears throat> Had it not been for the national sense of uh, humiliation, of the Versailles Treaty and the injustices associated with it, there would not have been nearly as much support for Hitler. He would have been written off. I recall the Nazi hunter, Simon Weisenthal, on TV in New York. I watched him when I was about 12 years old. And a question he was asked <clears throat> on TV in New York when I was a kid was, <clears throat> were all Germans Nazis, and he just laughed. He said, fewer than 15%. <clears throat> you only need the right combination of economic and political and social breakdown circumstances for a megalomanic dictator to come to power who's demonically invigorated to do so. Antichrist will emerge initially as an obscure figure who most people won't pay attention to, but people will progressively turn to him because he's offering easy solutions and national revival <clears throat> at a time when people are discouraged. This is called populism. Now, I'm not saying this to attack Donald Trump. I don't believe he's that. <clears throat> or, or Sanders is a left-wing populist. People will turn to some perceived strongman to give them an easy solution to a series of problems that have built up over some time of an economic and political nature. Britain, of course, disarmed after World War I. America disarmed. They were not ready for war. Japan was rearming. Japan had, had armed, Germany was rearming. Okay. <clears throat> you look at this now. The, the armed forces in America, Britain, are being cut. They cannot meet their quotas. They've got stupid people running it who say that their goals are climate change and equity and diversity and things. <laughs> you just look how absurd it's become. This week, You've got now <clears throat> nearly 140 attacks on American military positions in Syria and Iraq, orchestrated by Iran and Iranian proxies carrying it out. You've got the British and Americans engaged in open naval combat and now airstrikes against the Houthis. Biden removed the Houthis from the terrorist watch list, and now you're fighting them. While this is going on, while the United States and, it, 
and its allies are involved in, in a war. The American Secretary of Defense <laughs> is in intensive care in a military hospital called Walter Reed. And Biden, the commander-in-chief, did not even know it. <laughs> you couldn't make this up. It was exactly this kind of absurdity that left Britain unprepared and America unprepared for the rise of Imperial Japan and of Hitler. Peace, peace, but there is no peace. Unbelievable. Well, what happens? Hitler's view was to make an alliance with Mussolini a fascist. You had fascism in Argentina with Perón. You had fascism in France with the Vichy. You had fascism in Lebanon with the Falengo. <clears throat> you had a form of fascism in Greece. You had fascism in Spain with Franco. In the Spanish Civil War, the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, bombed the opponents, the loyalists, with Franco, in the support of Franco. Hitler's vision with Mussolini was, we're going to take the countries in the Roman Empire the Latin countries, and Germany, and more distant allies like the Ustashi in uh, Yugoslavia, as it became, and the Falango, and the Peronistas in Argentina, Juan Peron, Vita Peron's husband. We're going to take them, but in Europe, with Franco and Spain, and with Mussolini in Italy, and with the Ustashis in Yugoslavia, and with Hitler in Germany, we are going to resurrect the Roman Empire. We are going to reconfederate the Holy Roman Empire before the Reformation. Now, the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman. It was Germanically dominated. But that was it. The papacy ruled Christendom from Rome, and Germany was the predominant continental power opposed only by Britain or resisted only by Britain to any degree who was not ever fully integrated into it. There were people trying to pull Britain into it. Henry VII kept Britain out of it. This whole Brexit battle is something that goes back centuries and centuries. Napoleon tried to bring Britain into the union with the continent. That's what Hitler wanted to do. Um, they wanted to rebuild the Roman Empire. Napoleon did the same. When he went to Notre Dame Cathedral, when he came back from Israel and put the emperor's crown on his head in Notre Dame Cathedral, that's what they wanted to do, rebuild the Holy Roman Empire. <clears throat> That was what Hitler and Mussolini wanted to do. They had the Ustashis, they had Franco, they had the Vichy in France. The government of France became Vichy. The Gaul was exiled to North Africa and after it was liberated by the Americans and British, and then he came to Britain. He was nothing. He was a little nothing. France was mainly ruled by the Nazis and by the Vichys. They wanted to rebuild the Roman Empire. Antichrist will do the same. He will try to make the iron stick to the clay. And he will have ambitions to make a rapprochement with the Muslim world as Hitler did. That's what's going to happen. 
He's going to come in the character of Hitler. Mussolini, meanwhile, concluded the Lateran Treaty with the Pope, the sovereignty of the Vatican as a city-state. That was a deal made with Mussolini, the dictator. So what you see happening, this whole alliance with the Vatican, this whole role of liberal Protestantism, this ambition to extend European influence into the Middle East again, and the Middle East trying to get a role in Europe, this was a big deal. Now, there was a whole other aspect of this going back to World War I with the Ottoman Empire and its collapse with Turkey. And Turkey will play a role in the role of Antichrist and is playing a role today as the geographical bridge between Europe and the Middle East and the Levant. But I'll leave that out for the sake of brevity. It's already become complicated. I'm just trying to show what Hitler wanted to do and what he did. Three figures foreshadows the Antichrist, wants to make the Roman Empire again with Mussolini, and use fascism to do it, and use religion to do it. What else? In addition to his obvious hatred for Romani gypsies and his political opponents, Hitler represented himself as the savior from communism. Mussolini would save Italy from the Euro communists. Hitler would save Europe from the communists. And this made more and more people professing to be Christians to be sympathetic to him to that end. Well, at least he's not a communists, they're atheists. When you see this emergence of Eastern Europe and of uh, the neo-Sovietism, and, and the, let no one tell you differently, Putin, as Hitler lived his life in resentment of having lost the First World War, Putin Driving force is resentment at having lost the Cold War. He was a KGB officer. That's what propels him more than anything else. There are other things that propel him, but that is it. He wants to, in some way, revive the Soviet Empire and the Warsaw Pact if he can. He knows he can't fully do it, but he wants to do it to the degree he can. And he's threatening these countries. So somebody in Western Europe emerges as a strong man. I'll save you from the communists. <laughs> oh, look what's happening in the Ukraine. I'll, I'll save you. This kind of thing. I'll save you from the Islamic threat. We could say more but I want to keep it basically simple or as simple as I can. I hope I'm making sense. What Hitler did. Now he hated his political opponents. He hated gypsies. <clears throat> but above all, he hated Jews. Satan has always tried to exterminate the Jews to prevent the coming of the Messiah and to prevent the second coming of the Messiah. Goes right back to Genesis 3. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. You will bruise him in the heel. He will bruise you in the head. Prophecy about Christ will destroy Satan. The Lord of glory will crush Satan under your feet. It's not a triumphant church. Do not believe kingdom now theology, dominionism, over-realized eschatology, this is garbage. The church does not conquer Satan. Jesus comes back with the triumphant church. He doesn't come for one. The Lord of glory will trample him under your foot. 
And I've seen so many false teachers teaching error, like uh, Kevin Connor in Australia and writing ridiculous books on how the church is going to be triumphant and, and conquer the world for Christ before he comes. This is all garbage. You'll bruise him in the heel. Now, the Hebrew word for heel is akov, akov, where you get the name Jacob, Yaakov, Yaakov. My father's grandfather's name, my name in Hebrew, Yaakov, Yaakov, Yaakov. The King James translators anglicized it to James. Uh, but it was Jacob, Jacobites in, Scotland, in the history of Scotland, the Jacobites. So it goes. Bruise you in the heel. Satan was going to get Yaakov. At the end of the age, in the time of, of the 70th week of Daniel, we read the time of Jacob's trouble. From Amalek to Pharaoh to Haman, Satan has always tried to exterminate the Jews to prevent the first coming of Christ. So too. The return of Christ depends on God's prophetic agenda for two groups of people. The faithful believers, faithful church, faithful believers, and Israel and the Jews. Satan must try to wipe out the true church and not the apostate church, the true church, and the Jews to prevent the return of Christ. What you've seen happening now in Gaza, these things, the, the, the Palestinian marches in London and New York, and this is Satan. This is Satan. From the river to the sea, we're going to kill all the Jews. This is Genesis chapter 3. That's what it is. These are just the armies of Satan. These pro-Palestinian pro protesters are the armies of Satan. As they're called. I have nothing against Arab people, by the way. But Islam is something else. And I love Jewish people. But Talmudic Judaism, Rabbinism is something else. I have nothing against Catholic people, but Roman Catholicism is something else. I have nothing against Protestant people, but liberal Protestantism, the World Council of Churches, and all that garbage is something else. C of V, e, et cetera. It's all rubbish. Satan will use religion. Got to wipe out the Jews. He'll bruise your head. You're going to bruise his heel. Right from the beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Satan has tried to wipe out the Jews the way Hitler did with his final solution. Hitler killed two-thirds of global Jewry, one-third of continental European Jewry, two-thirds of world Jewry. Tried to wipe them out. Wasn't the first one. Amalek, Haman, Pharaoh, others have tried it. Antichrist will come in that character and do the same thing in the time of Jacob's trouble. He will try to destroy the Jews and the faithful church the way Hitler tried to destroy the Jews. If you want to know about the Great Tribulation, during the Holocaust, being born a Jew was a capital crime. Being born a Jew was a capital crime. In the Great Tribulation, being born again will be a capital crime. It's basically that simple. The same as being born a Jew during the Holocaust and the Blitz was a capital crime. Being born again will be a capital crime under the Antichrist and false prophets. Again, we have other teachings and books addressing this subject on the Morio website and so on. So, there's that. Finally, the Americans and the British get their acts together. The Canadians, the Australians, the Kiwis, the English-speaking nations, the five eyes as we call them now, they clean up their act. But there was a problem. The dragon and serpent are cast down to you in Revelation. 
Satan will attack through persecution, the dragon, but the serpent, the seducer. There were fifth columns. There was the Vichy in France. Even in the royal families of Holland and Belgium, you had Nazis in the royal families of Holland and France betraying Holland and France to Hitler. In Ireland, you had the blue shirts. The Nazis had the brown shirts. Mussolini had the black shirts. The Irish Republicans had blue shirts. They gave the Nazi salute. Representative of Sinn Féin went to see Hitler and wanted to broker Nazi support for an Irish uprising against the British. Now, again, I don't support the colonization of Ireland. I'm simply saying that you had a pro-Nazi element in Ireland. Eamon de Valera, born in New York, the first Taoiseach of Ireland, when Hitler killed himself, he went to the German embassy in Dublin and signed the Book of Remembrance in tribute to Adolf Hitler. That was Eamon de Valera. You had the blue shirts in Ireland. In England, you had the Cable Street riots. There were pro-fascist people in England. In the United States, the Ku Klux Klan was initially favorable to the Nazis. There was an American Nazi party, and they were in bed with the Klan in the American South. There was a fifth column. You had people who were sympathetic to Hitler, who tried to force Britain to compromise and make concessions to Hitler. Again, Charles Lindbergh had that leaning. Joseph P. Kennedy, the father of JFK and Bobby Kennedy, had that leaning. Now, his sons did not agree with him. His sons did not agree with him, but the old man did. Again, partly because he came from that generation of the Easter uprising and the black and tans and so forth. <clears throat> Similarly, the Finns, they were not Nazis, but they hated Stalin so much because of what the communists, the Soviets, taken their land and the next part of Finland that they made a treaty with Hitler, even though they were not Nazis themselves. You had other people in Lithuania the same. They hated Stalin so much, they were willing to make a deal with, with, with Hitler. Well, that is going to happen again. You will have people who will make a deal with the Antichrist because they will say things like, well, at least he's against radical Islam, or at least he's against, you know, neo-Sovietism or something like that. He planned it out. Hitler thought he could get away with it because in World War I, the Americans came into the war in alliance with Britain. But if Americans and Britain were fighting in the Pacific against the Japanese, they wouldn't be able to do it. That's what Hitler thought, but he, of course, guessed wrong. So now let's talk about his downfall. Hitler took his own life. We read that not by any human hand will the Antichrist be killed. He'll actually counterfeit the resurrection of Jesus. The Lord will destroy him with the breath of his coming of us. Now remember, the full character and persona of Satan will indwell the Antichrist. The same as the full character and persona of God was in Jesus as a man, in, in Christ, the satanic equivalent will take place with Antichrist. Following the battle of Stalingrad in the east, the eastern front of the war in Europe, Following Stalingrad, 
and following the Normandy invasion. D-Day. The Nazis were in a situation where they reckoned they probably could not win. Hitler's generals realized this. Hitler refused to face it. He retreated into his bunker in Berlin, just like Hamas, hiding in the tunnels, using his own civilian population as human shields, just like Hamas. The people today screaming about the Israelis committing genocide. Who screamed about Bomber Harris, Arthur, Arthur Harris, uh, bombing Dresden? Uh, or the Royal Navy shelling Hamburg uh, and killing a lot of German civilians. When Yodel, one of Hitler's deputies, tried to negotiate with Montgomery, Mar Marshal Montgomery, your Marshal Montgomery, Montgomery said, don't tell me we're killing women and children. There was a city named Coventry. The men were gone to war. There was only women and children living there. And you bombed Coventry and killed them. We're not killing women and children. We are killing Germans, and we're going to keep on killing Germans until you surrender unconditionally. You can end this war tomorrow. Surrender. Hitler wouldn't. Well, Hamas can end this war tomorrow. Surrender. But they won't. They'd rather see their own civilians butchered the way Hitler did. Well, they hide in a tunnel like Hitler did. Same thing. The Israelis are no more guilty of war crimes than the British and Americans were in their response to the V2 attacks on London and to the Blitz and to the Holocaust. No more guilty. Did the same things. So, Normandy does not go out well initially for anybody, but particularly bad for the Americans at Omaha Beach. But with the help of God, they make it through. More success in Utah Beach, the British and Canadians, more success at Gold Beach, Juno Beach, and Sword Beach. And eventually the Americans break through at Omaha Beach. Then they go into the hedgerows and the battles get even worse. Germans are desperate. The second wave American attack comes with Patton. And they push the Germans back to something called the Boucher de Filet, the, 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 the pocket of Filet in the north of France. And Germany heads east, crossing the Rhine into Germany. The Russians begin coming west after Stalingrad. The Americans and British are heading east after D-Day and the Pouché de Follet. The Pouché de Follet. Come here. Meanwhile, from the south, Montgomery and Patton had already taken Sicily and attacked Italy. Hitler's alliance with Mussolini goes to the wall. Mussolini is captured. German commandos rescue him initially, but then he's captured again and killed by his own people. Italians have had enough. The people in northern Italy never liked Mussolini anyway. But in the early decades of the 20th century, you had massive Italian immigration from Naples and southern Italy to New York and Boston and Chicago. And Italians were really angry when Mussolini made an alliance with Hitler. They didn't understand why they invaded Ethiopia. Italians didn't know where Ethiopian was most. Ethiopia was most of them. And they didn't understand the idea of the Third Reich. I've got a brother in New York. I've got, you know, a cousin in Boston. You know, why should I fight other Italians for Hitler? So they stop fighting. Mussolini's deposed and Germany occupies Italy and the Nazis become the government of Italy. 
the Italians under the Italian president joined the Allies. They had fought with the British and Americans against Germany in World War I. And the Italians fought fiercely against the Austrian-Hungarian Empire in the Alps, the, the battles, the, the, some of the bloodiest, most costly battles of European history were fought by the Italians against the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Italy fought the Germans and the Austrians in World War I. The people couldn't understand why they're fighting with them against the Americans and British now when the Americans and British had been their allies in the First World War 20 years earlier. Not only that, there were so many Italians in the United States <laughs> and so many Italians in the American military. They just couldn't understand what this was crazy. Hitler's world began to collapse. Hitler's world began to collapse. The French came and they began hanging the Vichy. The Gauls people put them on trial and for treason and so forth with the Fifth Republic and things like this. Stalin is coming in from the east. Patton, Eisenhower, Montgomery coming in from the west. And the Americans are pushing up the Italian peninsula with the British. What did Hitler do at this time? What did he and Goebbels do? They became more and more desperate. They dug in and tried to fight to the death in Italy at Monte Cassino. They put up a heck of a fight. And at Anzio, Anzio was like the D-Day of Italy in the Mediterranean. They put up an incredible fight. But they could not prevail against the Allies in Italy. The Americans and the British, particularly the Americans, began arming massive sea lifts going into Archangel Russia, north of Leningrad, massive amount of munitions to Stalin. Russia, the Americans did not bail them out, but they, of course, take that out of the history books in Russia. Additionally, unlike the Americans and British who were fighting on two fronts, and unlike the Nazis who were fighting on two fronts, Russia only had to fight on one front. But they sustained huge civilian casualties, unspeakable, higher than Britain. But they only had to fight on one front. Everybody else was fighting on two fronts, <clears throat> including Hitler, including the Americans, including the British. They get more desperate. They put up a heck of a fight in the South at Monte Cassino and at, at, at Anzio, but it doesn't work. Then, in desperation, they make a last attempt to reverse what happened at Normandy and push the Allies back to the coast by coming up from southern Belgium and Luxembourg, up north through Belgium to reach the port of Antwerp and cut off the Allies' capacity to supply itself logistically readily. The supplies would have to come from Le Havre and Cherbourg and Calais and things like that some distance away. This was called the Battle of the Bulge, down where Germany, Luxembourg, and Belgium come together around a place called Bastogne. It was Hitler's last attempt, and he almost did it. The Americans held out, particularly the 101st Airborne at Bastogne, or outskirts of Bastogne, and then Patton arrived and pushed the Germans back across the Siegfried Line into southern Germany. That was it. After that, the Americans and British began entering Germany through Remagen and places like that. They crossed the Rhine and they were heading across Germany. Patton leveled Germany. He leveled most of the country from Bavaria, from the Alps, 
from the Austrian border all the way north. He leveled it together with the, uh, the Army Air Force. They just leveled it. Hitler was in his bunker. Eventually, the Soviets crossed the Alda River and were getting closer to Berlin. Hitler became more desperate. There were 80,000, 80,000 Soviet fatalities in taking Berlin. It became a very sinister political game. The Allies knew Hitler would lose. So it became how to play better chess than Stalin. Instead of going for Berlin, the Americans went for Bavaria and for the Alps to stop Stalin from getting it after the war. The situation at Berlin was such that Eisenhower told Churchill and Roosevelt, uh, I'm sorry, then Truman, why should we take Berlin? Let's negotiate with Stalin to divide it. Let them take the heavy casualties. It's going to kill tens of thousands of people trying to take Berlin. Let the Soviets take it. Then we'll just march in after it's already been taken. And <laughs> let, let the Russians die. Let the Soviets die instead of us. So they made this deal with Stalin. And they had these things in Potsdam and places like that. And they just went in and they went in without firing a shot. The Russians had already taken Berlin, but the Russians had to give West Berlin over to the Americans, British, and French. What was Hitler doing in his bunker, getting more and more crazy? Well, it shows us what Satan is going to do and what Antichrist is going to do. They had the ovens and gas chambers in the extermination camps going 24-7. While they used Jews as slave labor in the concentration camps, killing many. But now it was the war is lost. We're just going to take as many Jews with us as we can. They killed a million and a half Jewish children. They just killed Jews day and night, desperately trying to wipe out the Jews because he knew he was going to lose. Antichrist will do the same thing once the rapture and resurrection of the true believers happens. The Antichrist, the power of Satan, is going to turn his focus towards the extermination of the Jews. What Hitler did is exactly what Antichrist will do. We can think of D Day in the West and Stalingrad as the turning point. In the Pacific, after the Battle of Midway, it became strategically impossible for the Japanese to win the war in the Pacific. They couldn't do it. They put up some bold efforts, but they could not stop the Americans anymore after the Battle of Midway. After the Battle of Stalingrad, the Nazis could not stop the Russians. Couldn't do it. After D-Day, the Americans and British could not be stopped. They tried with the Battle of the Bulge, but they couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Made similar efforts in Italy. They couldn't do it. But in their desperation, they tried. Satan, knowing his time is short. <laughs> he gets more and more desperate. Initially thinking he can win. But knowing his time is short, we are told by Peter in the New Testament. 
he becomes more and more desperate in his battle against the body of Christ and then in his efforts to exterminate Israel and the Jews. Couldn't win anymore, but he fights anyway. This satanic character of Antichrist was in some way, to some degree, incarnated in certain historical figures, Adolf Hitler being one of the main ones. I, again, I could make a similar presentation about other figures, and there were people as bad as Hitler, like Stalin and Mao. But we're talking about Hitler. False Christ and false prophets. Hitler was a false Christ. Goebbels was a false prophet. The way they came to power, through a combination of politics and religion, the way they were backed by false Christianity, by apostate church, the way they had ambitions of the Middle East and of resurrecting the Roman Empire through fascism, the way they hated the Jews and were determined to annihilate them, and the desperation by which they tried to hold power. Now, there were major, major battles that were catastrophic for the Allies initially. Monte Cassino in Italy was catastrophic, particularly for the British and the British Commonwealth. Anzio in Italy was catastrophic losses for the Americans. Omaha Beach was catastrophic losses. The Battle of the Bulge was catastrophic, catastrophic losses. And there were no shortcuts. The British tried shortcuts. The two main shortcuts the British tried did not succeed. One was the dam busters. At the locks of Scotland, the British had these round bombs dropped from airplanes, from Lancaster bombers, that would bounce on Loch Lomond and on Loch Ness. The British practiced developing these bouncing bombs that would bounce off the water and hit a dam. They hoped to have blown up the dams and flooded the Ruhr Valley, the industrial heartland of, of, of northwest Germany, and destroyed Germans' industrial capacity by massive flooding. Well, the bombs worked, and they did some damage, but it didn't work anything like they had hoped. Nothing. <coughs> The other was the market garden thing at Arnhem, when British and, and, and Polish paratroopers uh, tried to end the war by seizing the crossings of, of, of the Rhine into, into Germany by going as far in as Arnhem, which is in the area of, of uh, eastern Holland, near the German border. They thought they could grab the bridges. And again, it was a, a, a military disaster. Our victory is assured. But there will be Anzios and Monte Cassinos. There will be Arnhems, a bridge too far. There will be battles of the bulge. Nobody says it's going to be easy, but in the end, there is a certain victory. In Christ an ultimate victory. Now, in addition to trying to kill as many Jews as he could while there was still time, there was something else Hitler did and his Nazi cohorts. Kill as many Christians who were opposing him. The most famous of these born-again believers, of course, was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who authored the incredible book, The Cost of Discipleship. A few weeks before the war ended, Himmler and the Gestapo had Dietrich Bonhoeffer murdered, knowing it would achieve nothing and they were going to lose the war anyway, but they just wanted this believer killed because this believer had opposed opposed Hitler. He was in prison and they, they, they executed him. Um, once again, the same pattern. 
kill the Christians, kill the Jews, kill the Jews, kill the Christians. Finally, they were looking for ways to escape, not Hitler himself. He was going to die in the bunker. Not Goebbels, not Himmler, but others. Most notably or famously Eichmann, but he was not the only one, Adolf Eichmann. Remember, the Peronistas, the Peron dynasty, or the, the Peron, sorry, Junta in Argentina, Vita Peron, as in Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. Um, they, they were fascists. And that is why so many Nazis tried to escape to Argentina successfully, some to Brazil, most to Argentina, because of the Peron regime, who was actually more friendly to Mussolini than to Hitler, but also on good terms with Hitler's Nazis. It was again the Vatican to the rescue. It was the Vatican, the papacy of Pius XII, who organized the rat lines, helping the Nazi war criminals responsible for the holocausts and the uh, gas chambers and the execution camps uh, in, in the concentration camps to escape to South America. Um, these were the rat lines. Um, as late as 1980, Klaus Barbie, one of the major Nazi war criminals, was being hid in a Roman Catholic monastery in the 1980s. In the 1980s, he was finally caught. It's unbelievable the role that the Vatican, of course, played. But what you saw was the pattern. They knew they were going to lose, kill as many Jews, kill the believers. Antichrist will do the same. Why do we look at history? We look at history from the perspective of biblical prophecy. We are told by Jesus there would be false Christs. Hitler was one of them. He was an antichrist. False prophets. Goebbels was one of them. There are others, again. But we have to understand these other antichrists or types, shadows of the Antichrist in scripture and in history. Certainly during the history of the early church in the early centuries of Christianity, certainly throughout the history of the Jews, but certainly even modern history. We have to understand without speculating or conjecturing, but with sound exegesis, construct a paradigm of what these prophetic scenarios are going to look like. And then we examine current events, current history in that light. When you look at what's happening even this week with the Houthis and in Gaza, And in the Ukraine, in light of biblical prophecy and its patterns, you'll have a much deeper understanding of what is happening and why than any politician in Washington or NATO or London or the United Nothing in New York. Much better. They don't have a clue. When you understand prophecy from God's word under the illumination of the Holy Spirit, when you understand prophecy, you begin to understand history, salvation history, Heilsgeschichte, Jewish history, church history. But you also understand future history future history. The Lord will give us this wisdom if we ask with right motives. I told to James, if anyone wants wisdom, let him ask. Thank you so much for listening. My name is James Jacob Pratch from Warrior Ministries. We're so happy you've joined us here on RTN Christian TV and Radio from Scotland. Every blessing and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much.
Should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven?